for bioinformatics. And so before we begin, let me ask all of you guys, have you heard of the term data science and the term bioinformatics? Okay, can you share your understanding of, of the two terms? What is data science? What is bioinformatics? Okay, all right, that's good, that's a good, can we have your viewpoint? Wait, let me summarize what you have just said in one, one sentence. So you said that we're collecting information and then you're using an example of collecting information on patient and then you're gonna analyze the information in order to make a decision for a therapeutic uh, purpose or application. Okay, very good. And how about you? Yeah, that's a very good definition. Yeah, so you probably have heard of bioinformatics before. And so you're essentially telling us that it's like the merger between computer science and using it for understanding, analyzing biological data. Okay, very good. And how about you? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. All right, so all of you probably have a good understanding already what bioinformatics is and what you're going to be learning today, okay? So I'm actually recording this lecture, okay? Would it be okay if I post it on YouTube? Okay, yes? Okay, very good. Okay, so this is my favorite quote. I will argue that computational thinking and computational methods are so central to the quest of understanding life that today, all biology is computational biology. Because as you have told us, as scientists, we collect data. And we don't collect small amounts of data, we collect large amounts of data. And because we have robotics, and because storing information is now cheap, right? And we have access to a lot of computational power, computational resources to analyze data. Therefore, we could harness all of that in order to find knowledge, insights from the data, right? So it's not only that data science or bioinformatics are using computer to make sense of biological data, but both are a service to the broader scientific community, right? Because typically if they don't use data science, before they would have to use statistics. And before statistics, right, that would, we would just have hypothesis. We would just have guess, guesses, right? Because if you cannot prove it by experimentation, and in order to have a reliable results or finding from the study, you need to have larger sample size, right? You need to have it validated by statistical values, like p-value, right? And so data science is becoming a very big thing lately, and a lot of industry are making use of data and data science, okay? So what exactly is bioinformatics? So before it might seem impossible, you know, to make sense of all of the large exponential amounts of data, but then it is now possible because we can harness statistics, computer science, information theory, in order to make sense of the big biological data. Okay, so bioinformatics, it allows you to understand the molecular basis, you know, like the, the small minute detail of how disease happened. And so I'll provide you an example here that you could identify which gene is responsible for a disease by comparing the gene frequency between two populations, one having it and one not having it. But then this is a simplistic view, okay? And I'm sure in systems biology, in bioinformatics, there's more complicated pathways, okay? It's not simply the upregulation of genes. Maybe the genes is already there. Maybe there's no change in the frequency of the gene, but maybe there's other changes in the body, metabolite changes. And metabolite changes could reroute and influence the production of the gene product, which is the protein, okay? So biology is very complicated. And if we don't make use of computer science, computational approaches, it will be quite difficult to handle the vast amount of data, right? So, as one of you have mentioned already, bioinformatics is an area where computers are used to make sense of big biological data. And so, bioinformatics is growing exponentially after the Genome Project, right? In the early 2000s, we have the Human Genome Project, which, at the time, we hoped that it would unlock the mystery of life. But then, it just started to open what you call the Pandora's box. And it's just the first tip of the iceberg or the first piece of the domino, all right? And there's so many pieces afterward. We have proteome, metabolome, microbiome, metagenome, interactome, glycomic, and there's so many other omics 
data. If we could summarize the task that bioinformatic can do, we could summarize it into four major tasks. Okay, so the first one is search. So the most obvious thing is when you have a question, you want to get understanding. And how do you gain understanding? By searching. Because normally you would Google, right? Google for the information that you would like to find out. Same thing, if you have a protein or if you have a gene or a compound, you would like to Google it, but then you Google it in specific public database, right? You have GenBank for genes, you have Chembo for compounds, um, you have Uniprot for proteins, you have Protein Data Bank for protein structure, right? Um, there's so many more. You have Keck database, K-E-G-G, for the biochemical pathway. And afterward, you want to compare, right? You have your gene, you have your protein, and then you need to compare it to other protein in the database. Or you have your gene, and you want to compare it to other genes in the database, right? And in, in terms of the protein sequence or the DNA sequence, the comparison, I think you would have heard of the term BLAST. You have heard of it before. And you have heard of the term sequence alignment, right? right? Where you compare the sequence from multiple species, and then you want to see what is the consensus, right? And then typically you would use it to design your primer, right? Or you would understand, okay, what, what is the, the consensus region? They're probably conserved for the function to happen. And what is the variable region? And the variable region could give rise to drug resistance, okay, if it's a, if it's a microbial protein and it's virulent. And number three, a very common is to build models, right? Models will allow you to understand complex information because you're simulating it, right? Like for example, if you don't have the crystal structure, you would build a homology model. You would predict the protein structure. Or if you already have it from experiments, like the X-ray crystal structure, but then how are you going to visualize it when the protein is so small? It's smaller, smaller than a micron because bacteria are in the micron size, right? Micrometer. And if it's so small, okay, you, you, can't, you cannot even look at it under the microscope, okay, the proteins. So how can you visualize it? Therefore, you need models, right? So they develop molecular models of proteins, of compounds, right? And models can mean many different things. You could have the structure model, you could have the prediction model, right? And you could have so, so many, many other types of model. So model is a generic term which is used to represent a collective, a collection of all of the structure and relationship, the data types of a data set, right? Like what is the relationship between the chemical structure and the biological activity? If you build a model, the model will store all of that information, right? It will store the information about the relationship between the structure, which is quantitated through numerical descriptor, okay, which you will learn in this presentation. And number four, very important. What I've told you, the first three, search compare model. It might occupy your 20% of the time that you use to do bioinformatics task or data science task. Number four, integrate and curate. This will take you a lot of time. And many people give up during this stage because the data, the information will be very dirty. There will be a lot of redundancy. And at the first time, when you have a look at the data, it might not look like it could be modeled, all right? So you have to create the data sets. You have to combine data sets or, or information, raw data from many sources of, of database. And each database are heterogeneous, meaning that if you compare them, they will not look the same. They will have different columns. And even if they have the same column, they will be called different things. And so the trick is, how do you combine it? How do you, how do you know that compound ID from database A, molecule ID from database B are exactly the same thing, right? So you have to, so a human will have to evaluate that and then normalize the information across all of the databases that they want to combine, okay? And then afterward, you would need to clean the data Right, because data are data dirty, because they might have redundant columns, they might have missing values. So you have to clean that. You have to impute, meaning you want to replace the missing value, or you want to cut the redundant column out. Because as you will soon see during 
model building, if you have redundant information, your model will be biased. Yeah, so you want to have your independent variable, or the x variables, which I will show you later on, to be independent from one another. Okay? All right, so these are the common tasks in bioinformatic, and I summarized it in the form of an infographic. Okay? So same information. So data scientists has been called the sexiest job of the 21st century. And it was actually the title of an article published in the Harvard Business Review by Thomas Davenport and DJ Patel in 2012, okay, so about nine years ago. And after since, the term data scientist has become on the upward trend. So everybody wants to become a data scientist. And therefore, companies are competing to acquire the best talent, the best data scientist. And therefore, they're providing pretty competitive salary. Right? In the US, you would make at upwards of six figure with an undergraduate degree, okay? And it's increasing over time. But what, what is to be loved about data science? It's not only the monetary gain that you will acquire, but data science allows you to, as the illustration demonstrate, convert data to insights via the data science process, okay? And so the data science process is actually kind of like an art form. There is a set of guidelines for you to follow, but then it's flexible enough for you to innovate. Okay, so if you have 10 different scientists, data scientists, analyzing the same information, I'm quite confident that all of you, okay, let's say that you're all data scientists and I give you the same data set. And I'm sure all of you will analyze it in a different way you're going to use different tools. It depends on what tools you are familiar with. And you're going to get different insights out of it. And if we can combine the insights, the unique insights, and different insights from each of you, we will have a complete view of the problem. So more and more data scientists, if they are analyzing the same information, we get to see the complete picture. Because if you imagine, if I have an apple, and if you analyze the data, you will see one face of the apple and you will see another face of the apple. And if we could piece it together in all possible rotation, we will see the complete picture of the apple. All right, because different people will have different view and different perspective, okay? And that is the beauty of data science, okay? Okay, so I told you that bioinformatic could be summarized into four major tasks. So data science could be summarized into three major tasks. And the first one is exploration. So what's, what's the first thing that you do when you acquire a new data? You want to understand the data, right? So don't jump to the conclusion, don't jump to the prediction model building process. But first, start by exploring the data. What is the data about? How many columns? How many rows? How many missing data? How many missing values do they have? What's the data type? Is it categorical? Is it numerical, right? Quantitative or qualitative? Um, what is it about? What is the category about? What is the topic about? What is the relationship between each column? What is the distribution of the data? Are the data binary, having zeros and one? Are they continuous, floating number, like 1.58, 98.58? Okay, so you could do that by using descriptive statistics, right? Where you calculate what is the minimum value of the particular column? What is the maximum value of column A? What is the standard deviation, okay? And then you could also compute, like, what is the intercorrelation between each column? How are they interrelated? Is x1 variable related to x2? Is x2 related to y variable? Okay, so you could use intercorrelation or Pearson's correlation coefficients. And another great way to understand the data is to perform data visualization. You would make plots, scatter plot, bar, bar plots, pie charts, violin plots, scatter plot, contour plots. There's so many, right? I mean, I, I could list a whole different types of plots for you. And you will see that one of the most intriguing thing of data science, I would say, that makes it an art is the data visualization, right? As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. You could easily spend the entire week to craft one single plot, which I've done on some of the papers that we have published can it take you one week or two weeks to make. Because the first iteration, you, when you make it, you have to think about the, the reader. When they see it, will they understand what are we tr trying to tell them? And then you try to make it as digestible as possible. 
you're trying to simplify the plot as much as possible. So it's not just dumping it into Microsoft Excel, spending, what, 10 seconds to make the plot that you literally spent six months to get the data. You're not doing your data justice. Right? You spent half a year making the data through experiments, and then you spent 10 seconds in Microsoft Excel to make the plot. You're not doing justice for your data, right? Yeah. So as I've said, data science is kind of like an art. And therefore, it could take you a couple of months to learn, but it will take a lifetime to master because data science is so vast. Okay? So there's so many sub areas of data science, which is overwhelming. And if you jump right in, I mean, the first day could be like, wow, this is so fascinating. And then you could spend two months, three months in, and afterward you realize how much information there is to learn about, okay? And don't get discouraged because discouraged will only stop your further progress into the field, okay? But just be aware that everyone else are like you, right? They don't know everything. But the important thing is you use the information in data science, the tool available to make sense of your data. That's all that matters. If you could add value to your data, right? That's the most important thing, right? Second task is inference, right? So inference allows you to use statistical tools to draw conclusions from your data, right? Because you do t-test, you do ANOVA, you do inter intercorrelation, correlation coefficient. You want to look at the trend, right? So you apply statistics to understand your data, to understand whether two variables are different, whether they are significantly different via statistical test in order to add reliability or confidence to your information that you're presenting, right? You're saying that A is better than B with a p-value of less than 0.05, right? So that adds credibility to your data, right? Prediction, we see this a lot. Right now they have self-driving cars, they have Amazon, they have this supermarket where you just walk in, grab everything into your bag, just walk out. You don't even have to check out because they have cameras around the store and they know who you are, right? They use computer vision. They capture your face, they compare it into a database, they identify your identity. You already have a credit card on the record. So whatever you grab from the shelf, the computer vision visualizes that, converts that into information, okay? Maybe you grab an apple, you grab a Coca-Cola can. And so they, they mark the information down into the database at the moment that you step out of the store, right, they make the transaction, right? So very convenient, right? So prediction can do many things. I will show you a list of what predictions can do, but there's two phases of it. One phase is that it improves our life, but another one is the ethical issue, the responsibility use of AI, right? And you probably have seen it from movies such as Terminator, Skynet, right, and how computer or AI, how evil they are in the movies, right? So that is something that we have to be aware of, okay? And consider the ethical issues and the responsible use of AI, okay? Because Peter Parker was told in Spider-Man that with great power comes great responsibility. So AI is very powerful. You have to be wise with how you use it, right? It could be, it's a sword. It could be used for good or it could be used for evil. And you know that they have deep fake. I mean, they have fake news. And sometimes you see celebrities talking, but actually they're not, because they use deep learning to create a fake version of the person. Or even they have a voice synthesizer, right? So this is becoming very scary. And therefore, ethical use and responsible use of AI is very important. Okay, so this is the overview of the process in data science. So you start with the collection of the data. And then once you collect the information, the information could be specific column from a particular database. If for example, you have, you have hundreds of database. You're cherry picking the information. You're chopping, right? You're going to the supermarket. You're taking items off the shelf. You're selecting which variable, which feature you want to include in your analysis. But before you do that, what do you need? You need to have a hypothesis. You need to have a research question that you want to find out. And in order to answer that question, you will try to find the information that are relevant to your question. And so you're cherry picking columns feature from different database. And then you have to normalize it, you have to clean it, right, to make it comparable, to make it compatible, 
And then after that, you perform exploratory data analysis. Remember exploring the data? You're computing descriptive statistics. You're making plus visualization. And after that, the EDA, right, the exploratory data analysis part, will give you a better understanding of your data. And now you know that columns one through 500 is relevant, maybe, maybe relevant for predicting the price of cryptocurrency or important for predicting the disease outcome of patients or important for predicting the success of graduate students, right? So you have a series of X that you can use to predict Y, right, the outcome. And therefore, you do, you do model building. And then once you get the results, you evaluate the model performance and you see if it is sound. And maybe you could go back to EDA again to identify other factor, build another set of models. Maybe you discovered that, well, you need additional data. Therefore, you go back to data collection, get more data, clean the data some more, perform some additional EDA, model build. And so this is an iterative process you could loop it to whichever component that you need, right? You could go back to collection, you could go back to EDA, and then it will be iterative. Finally, with all of the information are in place, when you're ready to move on, the final step is model deployment. It is when you wanna put it to the market. Similar to how, like for example, if you want to release a product to the supermarket, you have to do a lot of things. You have to conceptualize the idea. You have to test the market survey, market research. Does the market demand that? Create the product, optimize the product, do the branding, put it to the shelf. And then once it's out in the shelf, what do you do? You have to monitor it. Same thing here. You build the model, you make it into a application. Everybody could use your application, but underneath it is your model, right? And so this is the life cycle of the data science model. Therefore, you will see that it's not only data scientists, maybe this illustration is misleading. Actually, data scientists could do many of the tasks here, but if you take a cross section, data scientists could do maybe a minimal part of data collection, but data engineers are more skillful with databases, with all of the data infrastructure, so you have to work with data engineer. So data scientists could know a little bit of data engineering, but then in order to collect sophisticated data, you will need to talk to the experts, the data engineer, right? So data scientists might know a little bit, but then they have to collaborate with the data engineer. Data scientists might know a little bit about cleaning, performing EDA, but then they have to talk to the data analysts, right? Because data analysts have more of a business orientation they have more business acumen, they could have more domain knowledge, and therefore, you have to talk to them to get insights from the data in order for you to build the model. So you see that it, it is a team effort. And data scientists could then build the model, but then they could build a basic model, probably, but then they have to talk to the machine learning engineer. They are more skillful in developing state-of-the-art machine learning workflow, right? So as you can see, Data scientists could do a little bit of everything, but it also depends on the person as well, right? Some could come from a data engineer background and become a data scientist, and it also depends on the company that they're working at. Are they working at a big company, big tech company like Facebook, Amazon? If yes, then the roles will be more modular. But if they're working at a small startup company, one person will have to do everything, right? So it depends on where are you working at, okay? So, you might be wondering, what is the skill set that are required to become a data scientist? So I created this infographic, and I call it the data science landscape. And I released it on February 14 of last year, 2020. So it shows you that the skill sets that you need to become a data scientist include programming, statistics, data pre-processing, software engineer, mathematics, data visualization, machine learning, and also very important is the soft skill. So all of this are actually obtained by analyzing the LinkedIn profile. So as you might already know, LinkedIn is a, it's kind of like a social network platform, similar to Facebook, but then for working professionals, to network, to find a job, 
right? Okay, so here are some use case of data science. Number one, computers like the IBM Deep Blue have de defeated humans in Jeopardy and chess. And then quite recently they have the AlphaGo, right? And also they have the AlphaFold for predicting the protein structure. And now the AlphaFold 2 has, are now able to predict with accuracy rivaling the X-ray crystal structures, okay? You might know Google, Tesla, they're working on a self-driving car. NASA uses computer to simulate space mission. Aircrafts are designed by using computer simulation to look at the aerodynamic. Supermarkets, shopping malls, companies, they're analyzing customer data to find promotion for you. They send you coupons because they know you buy product A and they know that you're also likely to buy product B based on your prior shopping behavior. So why don't you use it for, for bioinformatics, for biology? Why not use it for improving quality, quality of life, for designing, developing a new drug, right? So data science in drug discovery, because in bioinformatics, there's so much sub-discipline. So let me give you an example of a sub-discipline in bioinformatics, which is drug discovery. So number one, right, data science, particularly machine learning, will be able to help you to look at the relationship between the structure of the compound and the biological activity, right? When you get the relationship in the form of a model, the model could make a prediction on new data, okay? Because the thing is, in vitro data are very limited. It might be difficult to assay it, it might be costly, and it would probably take a lot of time, considering that you might need to have information for millions of compounds available for decision making, but then maybe experimentally, you already have a couple of thousand. But for example, if you're working at like a regulation governmental agency, where you have to handle, let's say the companies are submitting their compound for use, but then the government needs to regulate the compound, right? They first need to determine whether the compound is safe or not safe, right? In order to have assigning them like a material data sheet, MSDS, or a, for safety, toxicity, evaluate the toxicity of the data. So it's quite impossible to provide justification for all new compound, but then if you have a database of known compound, you build a model, and let's say that your new compound have a similarity to an existing compound in the database, the model could make a prediction and say that this new compound is similar to compound Y, and therefore it is toxic with a prediction probability of 0 0.98, which is quite high because the structure looks alike, right? If one compound is known to be toxic and another compound looks almost the same, then they're also likely to be toxic as well. Okay, so this concept has been used for discovering a new therapeutic indication for an existing FDA approved drug. Therefore, they call this drug repurposing or drug repositioning. When you're teaching an old drug a new trick, let's say for example, you have an anti-cancer drug, you have never tested that it also has antimicrobial activity. You never know that. Let's say that five years down the line, someone else tested your anti-cancer drug and they, they discovered that it also has an effect, let's say for against antimicrobial infection. Therefore, they could reposition the anti-cancer drug to be also an antimicrobial drug as well. Okay, so that is called drug repurposing. And how can you do that? You can do it using machine learning, similarity between the compound and the protein, which is also applicable to personalized medicine. Because for example, all of you have cytochrome P450s enzyme, but then the sequence might look different and therefore you may react differently to the same drug. And if we know your sequence, we could predict which drug variant will be better for you, which will give you less side effects. Okay, so this is something for the future for you to ponder about the possibilities of data science in drug discovery. So when you apply data science in drug discovery, one form of it is called quantitative structure activity relationship. 
or shortly as QSAR. So it tries to find mathematical relationship between the chemical structure information and the biological activity. So the chemical structure tells you the unique molecular feature of the compound. So if you think of a molecule as kind of like a Lego block, you break down the molecule, you get the different building block, like a Lego. You have the different functional group. Therefore, you want to see which functional group does it have. Does it have a carboxylic group? Does it have the benzene? Does it have aldehyde? And there's so many. There's hundreds of substructure, right? The, the, the small component, they also call it the substructure or the functional group. So these are then called molecular fingerprints, okay? So the molecular fingerprint will be called the local feature because it tells you the, the constituents, the composition. But then at the global feature, you have one value, molecular weight, solubility, right? If you represent a molecule with one value, you call it a global feature. Like you represent a human being by one value, height, weight, blood pressure. But if you can represent it with many value, you're zooming in to the detail. One molecule, many value. Therefore, each value, you call it the local feature, right? You wanna have it as much detailed as possible. Like for example, what is your liver function test? You have several other parameters. What, so collectively, all of the biomedical record, each of them will be the local feature, okay? All right, so, okay, so this is a data set. When you wanna build a model, the fundamental unit of data science, one of them, if you have tabular data, it's a data set. And so what is, it, what, what is tabular data? I think all of you know this already. It looks like an Excel spreadsheet. You have the column and you have the rows. So in here, the rows, each row will represent a sample, like a, a molecule, molecule A, B, C, D. Patient A, B, C, D. Okay, so they represent by the rows. Each column, for example, the orange column that you see, X1, X2, X3. These are the input variables, input variables. Because when you build a model, you need to have variables that are inputs to the model. So they are the input variable. Pseudonymous term, they are also known as, in statistic, independent variable. Because each variable would have to be independent from one another. Because if you have two variable, which have the same correlation coefficient, they are similar, you need to drop one of them in order to be independent. Or you could call it the feature. You could call it the features. Another word is, you could just call it X. You probably have heard Y equal F of X. If I tell you this, you recall back to your mathematics 101 course in undergraduate, right? You already have foundation for data science, okay? Y variable, which is also called the output. Why? Why do you call it output? Because when you put in the input variable into the model, the model will process the input variable, make a prediction, and output the output variable. So they call it the output variable. You could also call it the dependent variable. You could also call it the class label, or you could simply call it the Y variable. So they are the columns, right? So your data, if you read a paper, maybe you call it the M by N matrix. Just know that M represents the row. N represents the column, okay? So this is a tabular data set, right? Because you wanna use the X variables and the Y variable to make a prediction model, okay? If you use both X and Y, we call it supervised learning. If you use only X, we call it unsupervised learning. I'll show you that, just a moment. EDA, okay? I mentioned already, it allows you to get an understanding of your data set, right? By doing descriptive statistic, mean value, median, mode, standard deviation, by creating data visualization, and also by reshaping your data. You could, you could perform pivoting, you know, like it, it might be the values in a column will be split into different columns, okay? Or you could transpose your data from horizontal to vertical or vertical to horizontal, okay? It, it seems confusing, right? Like for example, if I have one column and inside that column, I have the values 
Okay, let's say that I have a column called grades. I will have A, B, C, D, F in there. Let's say that I want to, I want to amplify that. I take out the values, A, B, C, D, F. I created five new columns. A, column A, B, C, D, F. And if the person has an A, I mark it with a one. And then the rest will be zero, 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 zero. And the person who typically have the value of B, I will mark the B column to have a value of one. All right, so this process is called hot encoding. Hot encoding, okay? So you're making like a column to be five different column. And then you would have it binary, zero and one, okay? Okay, data splitting. So let's say that you start with the data here in the gray color. Actually, all of the illustrations I've shown here are taken from my Medium blog post. I, I, I'm also a blogger. I, I blog about data science, okay? And then I also do YouTube videos about data science, okay? So all of these are actually in the Medium article. If you go to Medium, search for uh, data professor, and then you will find this, okay, in one of the article. I think this is in the data science process article, okay? So you have a data set here representing by the gray dots. Let's say that you used your entire data set to build a model. Okay, let's go, let's go with the reason why do you need to split the data? Okay, you could use the entire data to build a model and finish, but you wanna evaluate whether your model is usable for the future. Will it be any good for future prediction? So what do you do? You split your data. One subset of the data will be used to train the model and another subset will be used to represent the unknown. It will be used to represent the future data. What do you do? You do a, a very common ratio is to do a 80-20 splits. 80% 80 will be used as the training data to build a prediction model, and then you take the model to predict on the 20%, and then you will get the performance. That will be an indicator of your future performance, okay, and on the test set, right? They call it the testing set for the 20% and the training set for the 80%, okay? So it, it is used to make an extra relation, okay? If you make the performance for training set, you use the training set to build a model, and then the performance is only internal. So you call it model interpolation. But if your model could make outside inference, right, because we're making inference, right? If you could make outside, then you call it model extrapolation, extrapolation, okay? But then 80-20 is not the only ratio. It could be 60-20-20. It could be 80-10-10. It really depends. It could be 50-50, okay? And also, you would also do cross-validation. For example, you take the 80%, the training set, you take it to do cross-validation, but then you still keep the 20% to act as your unknown. And then you do the cross-validation on your 80%. Okay, so let's take a moment to understand this infographic. What is cross-validation? Let's start with the term cross. Why do we have the term cross? We have, we have many of these rows. What did each row represent? They represent a single validation. So that's the validation term. Okay, so you have cross because you have many, many rows and they are crossing one another. I will show you how they are crossing one another, okay? For that, I need to jump here. Okay, so iteration one, you split the data into five-fold. You say that you wanna do five-fold cross-validation. Therefore, because you wanna do five-fold, you split your data into five equal components, five equal splits, or you could call it five equal fold. And for the five fold, you would take one fold, you leave it out, the left out will be like a testing set. Remember the data splits, we do training and testing, 80%, 20%. And then we take the 80% to do another round of cross validation, whereby we, if we do five fold, we will split the 80% into five fold. We take one fold, we leave it out, we use the remaining four fold to build a model. And then we take that model to make a prediction on the left out fold, iteration one. Iteration two, the fold that we left out will now be included in iteration two. We'll now take a new fold and leave it out. And we, we use the remaining four 
to build a model. So you can see that each fold will be left in, left out, left in, left out. So we call it cross because each fold are crossing one another. Sometimes they are used as the, as the test set. Sometimes they are used for the training sets, okay? Cool. But you, you could also do a tenfold cross validation as well. And there's so many different types. You could also do Monte Carlo, two-fold cross bot validation, right? There's so many. You could do a nested cross validation where you do a cross validation, you, you divide it into five groups, and then for each of the group that you combine, you do another cross validation. So it's like a loop, nested, right? At the outer level, you do it. In the inner level, you also do it. And so sometimes they call it the double loop cross validation. So it sounds very complicated, and that is research. That's a part of research in machine learning, okay? Let's imagine you have a spreadsheet. Let's say you have 100 row. Row one through row 20, you leave it as fold one. In the first iteration, you want to take it out. They are left out, and the remaining will be used for training. By different, yes, they are different. They will not be here. When they are taken out, they're taken out. And then the second iteration, they're moved back in. And we take a new fold, row number 21 until 40 will be taken out. Is it random or not random? It is random, but you have to specify the value. Uh, most important thing about doing machine learning when you're using like Python or R, when you do cross-validation, it will be random every time. It is very important for you to set the seed number. Otherwise, every time you run it, you will get a different result. And maybe you wonder why. Therefore, you have to set the seed number. Okay. It might be confusing. What is a seed number? A seed number is kind of like, let's say that you could influence the outcome of everything to be the same. When you set the seed number, if you split the data 100 times using the same seed number, you will get the same split 100 times. But if you use a different seed number, you split the data into two components, the, the constituents will be different if you have different seed number. It's kind of like shuffling a deck of cards. Let's say that you take a deck of card, you split it into two components, and you put it back. And you do it again, but you have to ensure that you take out equal number of cards each time. And then you put it back. Take it out, put it back. Same seed number. But if you do different seed number, you have to shuffle the card, and then you take it out. But if you set the same seed number again, you will get the same shuffle, okay? So let's think of it as random shuffling if you do the random seed number. Okay, so. I told you that there's two major learning algorithms, but then actually there's three, right? I told you about supervised learning. If you have X and Y, it's supervised. What is supervised? Let's say that you, you're preparing for a mathematics exam. The teacher gives you a practice exam, okay? So you get the practice, you do the practice, and let's say that from the practice exam, the teacher will use almost the same as the practice exam, but maybe they will shift the number a bit modify the number. Therefore, you're able to practice. When you take the exam, okay, if the teacher used the same exact practice exam and they gave it to you on the exam day, if you are able to memorize all of the exam question, and if hypothetically, the teacher give you the same practice exam for the actual exam, you can score 100. That is supervised learning. You're learning by examples, but that is called training the model. If the teacher used the same exam on the real exam, the same thing as a training set. Remember how we split the data? Training, testing, we use a training set, build a model, take the model, predict the training set, right? So if we take the train model to predict the same sample that was used to train the model, we also expect that the performance will be pretty high. That is the first term, the model interpolation. How reliable is the model in predicting the data sample that was used to build the model in the first place? And then we also apply the model to make a prediction on new data that it has never been trained or seen before, okay? But in either way, training or testing, you call it the supervised learning because you are allowing the model to learn by example. Given X and Y pair, learn. Allow the model to learn. And once they learn, they can build model and make a prediction. Unsupervised learning. 
You only have the X. You don't have the Y. And a lot of things in life, you only have the X. You don't know the outcome. What happens? You could do unsupervised learning. How can you analyze data without a label? You could group them, right? Group them according to similarity, right? So the, you call that clustering, clustering. Or you could find relationship between the variables. So you call that association analysis. So those two are the common type of unsupervised learning. When you have X, but you don't have an outcome, you could find a similarity. You could group them together according to similarity. Okay, like this group is similar. The other group are similar, but both group are different because they are clustered differently. Sometimes you don't know the outcome of the patient. You just measure their blood profile. Based on their data, you cluster them, and then you notice there's three cluster. And then you have to make sense of the cluster. Then you go back, analyze the data, pull additional data in, maybe you pull another data in, and maybe that could serve as your class label. Therefore, you can see that model building is an iterative process, right? When you build the model, you figure out there must be a missing link. Imagine yourself like in a movie, um, maybe you're, you're in the matrix or you're in the minority reports, right? You're trying to piece in together information, right? Uh, this, this scene in the movie of minority report, report, I really like it, where Tom Cruise, he has his computer, he's moving information with his hands, moving from this database, this database, this database, to combine the information just by dragging and dropping different information and seeing whether the information provide value to the existing model that he is investigating, right? So this is unsupervised learning. And then we have another one, reinforcement learning. Any of you play video games? StarCraft, do you know? StarCraft, uh, probably .a. Uh, what, what do they have now? ROG? Uh, what, what was it? PUBG? Okay, what if you could teach an AI to play? And what if it could learn and win? It will lose maybe a million times, like in StarCraft. Someone created this reinforcement learning. So what the, the ultimate concept of reinforcement learning is the reward. Given the task that they're doing, they learn by trial and error. The AI will learn that, okay, doing this, they lose. Doing this, they lose. They lose a million times, but each loss does not go to waste. Each loss, they know, okay, they know the different pathway. L let's imagine you have a grid, a 10 by 10, very simple. You go to grid, let's imagine the row will be one, two, three, four, five, like an Excel spreadsheet. The column will be A, B, C, D, E, F, G. First iteration, you go to A1, you lose. Second iteration, you go to A1, you lose. Third iteration, you go to A1, you lose. So the computer figure out, if it keeps on going to A1, it will lose. What does it do? A2, it won. B2, it lose. B3, it won. Now it knows that it has to go to A1 and B3. So it will learn this slowly over time. The ultimate is the reward, is to win. That's the loss function. In model building, the ultimate is to build a model with low error, with high accuracy, with high uh, predictability, okay? So in reinforcement learning, you don't teach it anything. You allow the computer to learn by its own. And that is the concept of AlphaGo, AlphaFold. It learns by itself, okay? And therefore, that's the magic of AI. You don't even need to teach it. Just let it learn, and it can learn. And then, once it learns, you want to extract knowledge out of it. You want to allow the AI to explain. So what did you learn? Explain to us, so that we as humans can understand, okay? Like for example, to play chess or Go, to master it, it requires maybe a lifetime, right? To be a chess master. But now the computer could master it. You just maybe allow it a couple of months, right? If you have a supercomputer, it could even finish the task in a shorter amount of time, right? So this is reinforcement learning. Very exciting stuff, right? Like self-driving, it also learns, but from the environment, the car has sensors, right? You have the robotic vacuum cleaner the circular robot, it goes around the room. It has sensors. If it goes near, it measures the distance. Maybe it has like 10 sensors. If this sensor is, the distance is like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, maybe it have a threshold. If the distance is less than two, 
trigger it to move in another direction. So if it goes like that, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, it, it passes the threshold, then it has to move in another direction. And there is another wall, so it has to ping pong off the other direction that it goes to. And now, with each of that, they will probably understand the room. Version two. The first version they probably don't, don't memorize. But version two of the vacuum, I mean, if the creator wanted to do it, they could memorize the path of the room. And therefore, it would do it harmoniously. Even you have a, what if you have a cat walking around the room? Or how about a human being? Carbon dioxide. What if they have carbon dioxide sensor? I don't know, maybe they could create something new, right? It could be a version two, version three improvements. So you can see that AI is like experiments. When you're doing experiment, what are the factor? How can you improve it? And that's a fun thing. You, know, you could improve it by coding, by programming, right? So I, I don't know, like for me, I, the, the data I've learned to code, it practically changed the way I view the world because I, I feel like I have more control of the world in that I could automate tasks that are boring and it could be done automatically. Like for example, in collecting a data set, I could automate the task, automate the downloading, automate the filtering out of the redundant row, automate the removal of the missing value. Let's say that you have to do it manually, but if you automate it, maybe you spent five hours, 10 hours coding it, maybe it might seem like a big time investment, but in that five hour, 10 hour, you don't have to do that again for the rest of your life, unless the algorithm change then you modify the code again, and then you could do other tasks. And therefore, you could do more meaningful tasks instead of click, 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 download, removing column manually, because humans were also error prone. You have heard of human error. Maybe we're sleepy, we click the wrong column, then the entire data set is useless, right? Okay, so in supervised learning, there's two major types, classification, and regression. So the same thing, because it is supervised, it means that you have X and Y. How does classification and regression differ? Do you know? Can some of you provide answer? What are the difference between classification and regression? Okay. Okay. For what? For which variable? For Y, exactly. So quantity of when the Y variable is a quantity, like a numerical value, then it will be regression. But if it's quality, like the class label, or a categorical value, like yes, no, okay, zero, one, two. And let's say that zero, one, two has a meaning. Zero could be don't have, one could mean have, two could mean have a lot, right? When you, do, when you do bacterial grading or biochemical tests, you have one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus. You have the grading level, right? You have the intensity, low, medium, high, very high. Then you would use categorical, Therefore, you could do classification. Because if you do regression, it doesn't mean anything. If you predict the value to be 0.5, what is it? Is it one or is it zero? 0 0.5 doesn't mean anything. Unless you make it into categorical, then it has to decide if it's 0 0.5, will it bump up or bump down? So that is where the, uh, they call it the, the threshold. Threshold. If the predicted probability is at the middle of the threshold, will you, Will you predict it to be class A or class B? It also depends on the threshold. Maybe we lower the threshold to be 0 0.4. That is why we have to do rock curve. Have you heard of the rock curve before? R R O C. You could you could change the threshold, and therefore you get you could get better performance. Let's say that if you use a threshold of 0 0.5, and whenever the value is 0 0.5, it it is confused. But if it's 0 0.4, it bumps up. Right, 0 0.5 will be above 0 0.4. It bumps up, and you get better accuracy. Right, so the threshold could be another important part of the modeling process. Okay, so now you know classification and regression, okay? All right, so let's have a look at classification. So you have X and Y, and your Y is categorical. Maybe you have class A, B. Maybe you have grade A, B, C. You have class A, B, C right here. Now let's say that you, you could also take the same data here, X. So nothing is stopping you from using unsupervised learning if you have the y variable. You can just strip out the y and use only x to do the visualization of the cluster. Like if you have x and y, right? The first thing to do is, okay, are you gonna do classification or regression, depending on your y? And let's say that you take away y. You can use x to build a cluster model, like here. And because you know 
what class each sample belong to, you color it a different color. And that's the beauty of, you, of doing data visualization. You make a cluster plot you, using, for example, principal component analysis, and then you color the data sample by the class label. So for now, you could color it by, okay, does the person, let's say that Y is having a disease or not having a disease. It helps you to analyze the cluster much more. And for here, we can see that there is a clear distinction between each of the cluster. But in a real practical setting, sometimes there might be some clear differentiation between cluster. But sometimes some cluster are similar and they might be closer to one another. Maybe they overlap and we can't tell the difference between cluster A and B. Maybe they overlap by 50%, like advanced diagram. You have an overlap, right? And aside from coloring the data sample, you could modify the size to an, for, according to another variable. Back to the regression, okay? So in a regression, you have X and Y, and your Y is a numerical value, okay? It's like 1.05, 95.18, and then your regression is essentially a y equal to f of x, y equal to function of x, and x could be many x, and therefore your, your simple linear regression will start by y equal mx plus b. Like for example, you could have an equation like y equal 5x plus 5. And if you know x, if x is 1, you could calculate y. If x is 1, 5x, 5 multiply 1, you get 5, plus 5, you get 10, y equals 10, right? If you plug in x equal to 2, you get the value of y, right? So this is regression. However, your equation is the linear line that you see here, but in reality, the data sample are distributed around the trend line, above or below, because the trend line is an approximation, okay? So every time when you say something, you say 5.5 with an SD of 1.8. So 5.5, 1.8, that's the upper bound, plus 1.8, 5.5 plus 1.8, 5.5 minus 1.8, that's the lower bound of your data, right? So you know the upper and lower bound of 5.5, that's your mean, right? So therefore, if you have X, you could calculate Y. Okay, so this is an infographic showing how to do QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship, right? In prior lecture, you have learned about how to draw the chemical structure already, right here. You know how to draw this molecule, and therefore these are the molecule, right? Molecule one, molecule two. Molecule one and two, how do they differ? I showed it in the color. It differ from this one, the red atom that you see here, and the green atom. In molecule one, it has a CH3 at the position here, but in molecule two, represented by the red dots, it doesn't have that. But instead, it has CH3 at this position, which in molecule one, it doesn't have. Therefore, it is represented by a green dot. If you zoom in, you see the green and the red. But what's important is that the different chemical structure when you represent it in a computer, you do this process of calling, of performing molecular descriptor calculation. So it allows you to convert a molecule into binary form, into numerical form, which is called the molecular descriptor. And this is a type of descriptor called the molecular fingerprint. So it tells you whether you have it or you don't have the functional group. If you have it, it will be one. You use a value of one. If you don't have it, you will use a value of zero, okay? And therefore, you make a data set. Each row, like the first row here, the first row is white color, right? That's the, the name of the variable, the name of the x1, x2, x3, the name of the y variable. The blue color that you see is molecule one. The yellow color that you see are molecule two. Y column is the class label. What is the output? Is the molecule active or is the molecule inactive? All of this is called the data set. And then you use the data set comprising of the X and Y to build a model, a prediction model. But because your Y is a class label, it is 
categorical, qualitative. Therefore, your model will be classification. Once you build a model, you get this gray box, right? You have a new molecule, molecule three, purple color. The first thing you need to do is take the molecule chemical structure that you have drawn, and then you want to convert it into molecular fingerprints. After you get the fingerprints, you use it as an input to the model. The model will make a prediction on the input. You get a predicted value, and then that's your prediction. Your model will also generate a feature importance plot that tells you which feature are important, shown here in the feature importance. So you can see that, okay, X8, X10 are the most important feature for a molecule, okay? But it doesn't tell you important for what? Important for active or important for inactive. Then you have to do one more thing. You take that feature and you calculate the box plot. But you have to stratify the data. You have to separate it into active, inactive. Remember when I told you that you have a column, you call it the activity, and then the value under that one single column will be active, inactive, active, inactive. But if you could split that into two separate components, you would have 100 rows being active only, and then you would have another maybe 150 row being inactive. You separate them. You separate the active and inactive. In statistical analysis, you call that the stratification. Like for example, if you would like to see the effects of smoking on the population health, right? Smoking status column. You stratify according to smoker, non-smoker. Otherwise your data will be combined, but you have to separate it into smoker, non-smoker. And for each group, you do your analysis. You, you, you do your P, you, you do your t-test. You compare each column. Because our machine learning models say variable X8 and X10 are important, you do a t-test between the active and inactive for X8 and X10. Is it statistically significant? Okay, chances are they are, and you wanna see how much, okay? So therefore you can see that, actually no one tells you how to do this. It's an art. You have to learn the tools of the tree. And then once you understand to do each of them, you have to figure out in what sequence you wanna do it. You wanna do this first, build the model, get the feature importance, get the top important feature. Top feature is important, do t-test, separate it, stratify into active, inactive, you get the p-value that they are significantly different, right? So you, you could do many technology stacking, right? Apply method one, method two, method three, in order to explain your hypothesis that x8 has an impact on the activity. Therefore, you do t-test. You visualize it using box plots. You could use a bar plot. You use t-test p-value, right? So there's many ways. And yeah, so that, that's the major way that I would do. So we have already covered the entire process here. All right, so now let's take a look at this. If you want to do this yourself, you have three routes. Route number one, no code. Okay, you don't have to do any coding. You, you don't have to learn any R or Python. And there is a low code, meaning it requires you to use Python, but it requires you only minimal usage of coding, maybe one or two lines. And mostly, if it's low code, it will be auto ML, automatic machine learning, or automated machine learning. It means that what you just need to do, you just need to use R or Python, read in the data, clean the data, and when the, when the data is clean, you use the, the library like PyCaret, you use only one or two lines of code or three lines, depending on what you want to do. And then you're able to generate like 20, 30 models in only one or two lines of code. But in option three, code, this is more hardcore. So either Python or R, you have to write your own workflow. How will you impute missing value? Replace missing value. Do you want to replace the missing value by the, the mean value or the median value? Or do you want to delete the entire column if there's a missing value? Or you want to delete the entire row? That's for you to decide. Okay, if you have only one missing value, you want to delete the entire column. It's a waste. Delete the row. If more than half of your data is having missing value in that particular column, you could either delete it or you could also put in the mean value or the median value. Okay, that's the impute. They call it imputation. You could search that. And you could easily spend the entire day reading about it 
how do you replace missing value in a column or in a data set? So when you analyze the data, you will see hundreds of problems. Therefore, the important thing is, how can you iterate through that very quickly? Okay, so number one, there, there's several ways that will, that will make you slow. Number one, you get overwhelmed. When you get overwhelmed, what do you do? You could complain, it's too difficult. It's too much data. And if you complain, then therefore you will not do it. And when you don't do it, you waste time. And then maybe one or two months later, you figure out you have to do it. Otherwise, you won't graduate your graduate degree. Then you go back to doing it, but then you wasted two months of overthinking, right? Overthinking. When you see the problem, you don't do it. You're procrastinating. You're figuring out to find an easy solution. You look back, there's no easy solution. It's only you. Because when you're doing a graduate study, the thing is, you have to own your projects. The project is yours, right? If you don't do it, the project won't be complete. It won't have any progress. And that will only hinder your progress, right? Complaining, overthinking, what else? So how can you do it? You just need to take action. Just do it, make errors, fail, learn from the errors, iterate back, right? There's this concept called the OODA, right? So I've written a blog about that, how to learn seven effective ways to learn data science. One of them is about using, understanding the OODA loop. I think you probably have heard in, in clinical laboratory, they have the PDCA, plan, do, check, act. So we learned about no code, low code, and also coding, Python or R, and how that could help your, your analysis. Let's go back to you here. So I talked about learning data science. I, I think it could be applied to anything. You just take out the term data science, you put in med tech, you put in the topic that you want to learn, microbiology. First step is planning your your curriculum, what do you want to learn about? Therefore, you'll be proactive in your learning. Make a list of topics that you need to learn about. And then for the list of topics, you have to figure out, okay, where, where's the resource? You have to make your learning effortless. You know, the book from Atomic Habits, James Clear, how can you make it effortless? For example, if you want to read a book, you put the book next to your pillow. So therefore, before you go to bed, you see the book is already there, and you, you can just read it. Or how about making goals, posting it everywhere. You can have post-it notes, put it in the fridge, in the shower, in the door. Study microbiology, study chapter two, study. Whenever you walk around the room, it's a constant reminder. You could use it for consistency, reminding you what you need to do. Because sometimes when it is out of sight, what do you call it? It's out of mind. But if you see it, it's a constant reminder that you need to do it. So that is all of the planning. Knowing what you need to know, knowing what you need to do, and having a schedule. And if you have a study buddy, accountability. Tell your friend, I'm gonna finish the chapter two today. And then your friend tomorrow will ask, did you finish chapter two? And then you will answer, yes I did, and you'll feel proud. If you say, no I did not, you feel, you feel miserable. So your friend will be accountability partner, okay? So you can study in a group. Learning tips. Technique, technology, tools, there's so many. I told you about calendar, notepad, and you know, like Notion, and there's so many more. You can even buy a Pomodoro timer. You know the tomato timer? You, you set like 40 minutes to study, or 45 minutes to study, and you can spend 10, day, uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes for break. And you can repeat the cycle over and over. Okay? Because your attention span will lose. Like this lecture, it, I mean, you might get sleepy over if it passes 45 minutes, right? So, number two, learn, right? There's so many resources for you to learn about. Make a list of what is the resources that you will use. Or you could write an article, make a note, make it as detailed as possible, make a mind map. So if you create, what happens is that when you wanna create something, when you wanna draw something, you need to have an understanding of that topic. If you don't have it, then you have to go, go back to the notes, read it, understand it, draw the schematic. And when you can picture that, maybe, the art of drawing it will allow you to synthesize it, materialize all of the knowledge which is floating in the air, putting into concrete form, object. When you have the notes or the infographic, then that's your knowledge, materialized in the infographic, okay? So actually the art of making it, the craft of making it, it's like a revision. You're already revising for your exam by making that artwork, right? And the most important is to 
explain to someone else, teaching your friend about the topic, writing about it, right? It allows you to make sure that you understood the topic, okay? And then that's all. And okay, so thanks for your attention.